Hi, this is Ted Finch, the president of Channel.com. I'm going to go through building a SaaS channel, a step-by-step -step approach. Within the material that I go through, I'm going to talk about the channel. I'm going to set up some definitions. I'm going to talk about the channel in general. But if you do happen to have a SaaS product, which are really popular right now, there's several different differences, and I'll go through some of those differences. I'm also going to go through the three different phases of a reseller program, which is defining. The next stage is recruiting a channel. Phase three is enablement. And then I'm going to go with ongoing channel management, with, which includes motivation, plus I'll give you some additional resources. Okay, my particular background, I'm, you know, I've been doing channel marketing since 1989. Um, you know, I've helped build the channel for Microsoft, IBM, Adobe, WordPerfect, Intel, you know, all kinds of different companies, Canon, Compaq, you know, when they used to exist. Wrote the marketing plan for Netscape Navigator, helped finance Redstrom Entertainment with Tom Clance, Clancy, and I was the former VP of marketing at Goldmine, a VP at $4 billion Harcourt with SeaWorld and General Cinemas, senior VP at $33 billion Motorola, VP at General Electric, and I've gone through five acquisitions. Um, within the website, Channel Mall is the number one resource in the entire world for all things channel. I get about 15,000 unique channel managers that cycle through the site every single month. And then in my case, I've spoken at dozen, dozens of different conferences, and I've consulted and executed the channel programs for over 270 different programs. So these are some of the companies that I've worked with, where I've helped the channels, either recruiting resellers, defining the channel, building it all out, or troubleshooting the channels themselves. First thing I want to do is I want to level set everybody so that we get on the same terms. Because, for example, when I was at Motorola, they talked about their disties, but their disties were really resellers. They were not wholesale distributors. <clears throat> so I want to make sure I get all the terms correct. Okay, first of all, a channel is how a company sells their product. Sometimes it could be direct, which is where their direct salespeople call in accounts. Other times indirect, where the company will sell to a middleman, which then goes to the customer. A lot of these middlemen are called resellers. These resellers have different categories, which I'll go through in just a few minutes. There's also affiliates. Affiliates are, is also an indirect channel, but they typically refer, they do not sell. And a partner is, for example, a lot of times with a partner program, it's a legal term, so a lot of times legal doesn't like you using that term, but it is a partner program, and even companies like Microsoft with their teams of attorneys have managed to be able to use that term and get through Okay, just because the definition is within the channel itself. One of the terms I'll be using extensively is a VAR, which is a value-added reseller. So this is, this is a regular reseller, but the difference is they might also incorporate training, they might integrate, they might install. They do a lot more than just sell you a packaged product like a Best Buy does and then walk away. And then there's a system integrator, which is also a VAR, but just call it a super VAR. The system integrators can also do development. For example, one system integrator that I worked with here in Austin, Texas, had 58 in-house developers. That's more developers than most companies have. A distributor, the way I'm using the term DISTI or distributor, is a wholesale distributor. And this is someone like an Ingram Micro or a Tech Data or back in the old days, Maricel and, and Kenwood and some of the others. And these are guys that primarily warehouse the inventory, especially back when all software used to be packaged. They would warehouse the inventory, software and hardware, and then they would also finance the resellers. There's several different tools and values of a distributor. I'll go through some of those. MDF is a term that I'll use in here, which is the market development funds, which is funds that you could use to help support promotion, promotions that go through resellers. Co-op is another approach, but the difference is that co-op is typically accrued, and co-op is typically set up where they can choose how to use the co-op funds. MDF is where you actually use the funds. Channel conflict is where your internal reseller, your internal sales force, or your resellers may be competing for the same sale. Or sometimes different resellers of different types might be competing for it. So we'll talk about the purpose for channel conflict, why you want some, a little bit of overlap, and then how to overcome it. Okay, the one thing about these slides, you're going to see that there's a lot of density in this. Now I go through these really quickly, but the density allows you to take these afterwards because I assume that you're probably going to go back and use this to train additional channel people within your organizations. So you can darn near read through the screens and be able to pick up all the information instead of having to listen to the presentation just to be able to understand what some of the terms mean. Okay, let's go through those three phases. That definition stage is when you're defining the elements of your reseller partner program. 
Recruiting is when you're out there trying to find the right kind of resellers to sell your product. And enablement is, let's say, making sure that your salespeople actually start selling the product. So you have to train them on the product, the market, the resources, different levels of certification that you have, your sales tools, systems, you know, the leads, the model calls, coaching calls, different ways, and then how to motivate your reseller channel. These are all phases of setting up, moving through a complete reseller program. Two things that resellers typically look for, and this is the definition. Number one is your product competitive. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be the best product. I've seen products out there that were not as feature rich as some of the others, but they had very good positioning. There were a couple things in there that made them very unique. For example, like let's say a CRM product. There's one called Call Pro CRM, which is very good at accelerating your calls. So if you've got an inside sales team that's trying to make a lot of phone calls every single day, then that may not be the same product as Salesforce, but when it comes to making phone calls, it can definitely outpace a product like Salesforce. The next thing is, can I make any money working with you? So things that they investigate on that is, do you, do you have competitive margins? The next thing is, how much competition in my region? Which is why sometimes they'll switch companies, because with one particular product, it might just be too much competition. The other part is they want to know is, are you going to train me and my team? Are you going to get us up to speed? Or sometimes, are you going to charge us for this? Which is typically a barrier to entry, which I discourage when people are first setting up a reseller program. The next thing is, do you have channel conflict? So I'll talk about deal registration soon. That is one way where people essentially can call the ball and decide who's got that particular account. And then also, they're looking to see if you've got good sales tools. Do you have PowerPoints? Do you have demo scripts? Do you have a content portal? So most of this, can you make money, is determined by whether or not you have a good partner program. Okay, so let's define the partner program. First, we're going to talk about the structure, the levels, the margins, the requirements, the different sales tools, and the buckets of information that you should contain. We're also going to talk about the different types of support, lead generation, requirements, and then their overall reseller experience. And these are things that I value, that I look for, and that I test for when I look at other people's reseller programs. Okay, first, within the kit, this channel partner program, PowerPoint, has some additional materials with it, including a worksheet that shows a lot of these particular pieces. And so one of those is a comprehensive spreadsheet that shows all the partner features that you could possibly want. So every single time I find a new partner feature, I put it in here. Within the spreadsheet itself, you're going to notice, for example, it's got monthly newsletter. It's got these little red bullets right above each one of the sections. So if you highlight those, it'll actually give you help as to what those stand for. So add templates, what does that mean? What about an email? What about over here, sales presentations? Essentially, it's primarily PowerPoints. Do you have any branding guidelines? So essentially, we look at your, your reseller program with your online par partner portal, and we first look over here at your ability to communicate. The next thing is, what kind of resources do you have available for them? What are the extra benefits that they get out of your program, like the training, the evals, the not for resale copies, and then we come down here as to which different ways are you going to be able to generate leads and provide sales assistance. And then of course the last things we look at over here is the requirements, and then I usually grade the reseller experience. For example, one vendor that I worked with, it was terrible working with the company. When I sent emails in, I finally had to call five different times to be able to get somebody that could give me that information from the emails. Okay, so let's move through some of these specific things. First, let's talk about the structure of your reseller program. The levels. The typical leather levels out there are authorized gold and platinum. You can get fancy. Sometimes I've heard people call these unusual buzzwords, but this is not the time to get fancy with your program. Resellers have been doing this for the last couple of decades. And, you know, Novell was one of the early ones that came out with an authorized gold and platinum, and then other people try, tried to change the words. Just don't even bother. Just call it authorized gold and platinum. Then the resellers, it's sort of their terminology. They understand what that stands for. Okay, authorized typically in there, there's no commitment level. There's low margin, for example, and these are not the margins that you may need to use, but I'll just use 10, 20, and 30% just as an example. So at authorized, you might give them 10% margin. They, you have no volume commitment, no quotas, no anything, but they're able to sell your product. This is great for those resellers out there that will sell maybe one or two products a month or maybe even every six months. You still want those because when you get like a thousand of those guys, you're going to end up with maybe a thousand new sales every month. It's not necessarily the case. It doesn't scale quite that way, but you get the idea. 
Gold is the first one where you set up a quota. So it's the first level of certification. So the certification might require that they have a certain test that they have to take to make sure that they know how to install the product, that they know how to use the product, and then they'll get like a medium margin, like 30%. Platinum, they have a higher quota. So now they might be required to sell a quarter of a million dollars of your software or hardware every single year. Okay, plus the second level of certification. Okay, and so the second level of certification might be where they can now actually handle first and second line tech support. So Autodesk has a really good program on that with your certification levels. And so they get the highest margin, but you also have reduced expenses with the Platinum because you don't have to handle as much of the support. You're also willing to give them a higher margin because they're willing to commit to a higher volume. So you get someone who's Platinum and you're guaranteed if they stay there, you're going to get at least a quarter of a million or whatever your, your level is for the Platinum. Okay, why do we set up these levels? You know, one of the companies I was working at internally, they thought this was really clever, but then they said, well, let's just go out there with one level to start with because this is too complicated. They don't realize that this is actually less complicated than if you, if you set up multiple levels. I mean, more levels is less complicated than if you set up just one. Here's the biggest question. Who are you going to give your lead to? They said, well, why don't I give it to the guy who can close the best? And I said, well, how do you know that? Well, I'm going to look at the sales numbers. I said, why don't you just give it to the guy who's platinum? And then if there's no one platinum, if you, your, your rotation is first region and then it rotates by level and you have no platinum, then give it to your gold. Authorized don't get leads. Now, if you have to give it to an authorized, then that's fine, but you might have to walk them through the product. They may not have not known enough of it to help close that deal properly, but you still might want to support a channel or build that authorized so you can eventually get them to gold or platinum. Okay, the other reason why you set this up is you've got a shared sales force. And so you want them to prefer to sell your product. And so what happens is to maintain their level, they must meet a quota. If they sell your competitor's product, they may not sell enough of yours to hit the quota. And as a result, it reduces their leads. So sales manager says, you guys, stop selling that other, that other product. If we can't get a quarter of a million dollars worth of product out of this, we don't get 30%, we get 20%. Or they kick us out of the program. And seeing they're primarily our bread and butter, we better stick with these guys. So the higher levels reward people for dedication, reward them for being willing to commit to more loyalty to your product, and it also uh, rewards these people in a way that decreases your expenses because your support costs will decrease. And of course, it helps you decide who gets any leads with the highest getting the most leads. Okay, let's talk about some concerns. Partners fear that they can't compete. So imagine if you come into a program and it's filled with gold and platinums and you're only authorized because you're first getting in a program because that company says you've got to have, you know, $100,000 in the volume. Well, until you get $100,000, you know, you're not going to be able to get the better margin. So how are you going to compete with these other guys? You might even be a big, you know, $500 million system integrator and yet you're coming in and authorized and you can't get any traction. So this is what I always recommend. I grandfather all new partners into the middle gold level for the first 90 days. So sometimes longer for a new program. Usually for a new program, I grandfather them in and I set everything up for the first six months. Then once I see how everybody's doing, then I'll go through and divide my, my margins. I might look at that and say, gosh, my best players pulled uh, 200000 for the whole year or for six months. And then there's a couple that are right around one fifty. And then after that, it sort of branches down to about 50,000. So why don't I make my platinum at the 150 or let's say 100,000 mark and above? And anyone below that, you know, they're still going to be certified. I'm going to set them up so they have to do, let's say, 10,000 minimum, up to 50,000 or 100,000. And then they get into the next margins. So you really just don't even have enough information when you're setting up a new partner program to know where those levels ought to be. You know, it's just, it's not fair. These are your salespeople. You're just not being fair to your salespeople, they're expecting a certain margin which affects their commission. And so you don't want to mess around with that. So usually about six months to set up a new one. If you've got an existing one, you know, gold level for the first 90 days, it's assuming you've got a shorter sales cycle. If you've got a six month sales cycle, then at least grandfather these people in. Okay. But after you set the level requirements, you know, then you give three months to transition before moving down, staying or moving up. So again, most of this is just, if you're fair with the reseller partners, just think of them as your sales force. If you're fair with your sales force, they're going to be loyalty to you. 
If you jerk them around, they're not. Okay, now let's come over here and take a look at your partner program itself. Within the portal site is where you're going to pour your content that's going to help them to sell it. So I usually recommend there's two types of reseller port portals. One is just generic. Generic means everyone logs in the same name, same password. It doesn't really know who they are, but it just gives them a place where 24 hours, 24 seven, they can go in there and get whatever material that they need. Personalized, usually I wait till somebody sometimes has about 50 partners and it gets a little bit more complicated before we even worry about a personalized site. Because what that does is then they log in and the first thing they might see is here's your quota, let's say 50,000 and you're at 47,000. So it might say, you know, you've got 3,000 left, which is, which is maybe, and you can just do a couple of fancy things on that. Here's your leads. You know, thanks, John, for coming in. So, and then your gold, platinum, and your authorized might see different things within the portal itself. Your authorized might get generic access. Okay, but they may not have access to some of the sections that are reserved, like the lead section, for your, for your platinum and for your gold. Okay, so this over here is a sample partner portal that I have set up on channelmill.com that in a second I'll show you the URL and you'll have access to that. And you can go in there and just copy it. I usually recommend, I actually have a channel kit and the channel kit has all of the copy for this within a Word document. I recommend you just copy everything, paste it in your own portal, make the modifications that, that you need, which usually aren't very many, and you've got a reseller partner program. My record is setting one of these up in less than four hours for a company. Okay, so here's the channel sample partner portal, channelmill.com forward slash vars forward slash portal. It's got 43 pages of sample content. So if you look at this, it's got the partner portal, my accounts, the marketing tools, and then within the marketing tools, it's got buckets to put PowerPoints, demo scripts, video, competitive analysis, different things that you might need. If you don't have all of that, just eliminate those. But this shows you a lot of the kind of material that you ought to have. You ought to have it for your own salespeople, and you certainly ought to have it for those salespeople who are willing to work 100% commission. They're actually more valuable to you than even people working internally. Okay, because they're, they're willing to take a lot more risks, so they've got more skin in the game, and a lot of times they'll sort of pick it right up. Okay, so defining your reseller partner program. What I do is I typically work with somebody and we go through that spreadsheet and we define every element that they need. Then those elements they need determine the content that they need to put in their portal site. So again, it's very simple. So some of the standard information sales marketing tools is market information. For example, if you sell set-top boxes, who do you call on? Do you call on the IT guy? Do you call on the president of the company? I mean, simple things like your region, you know, who the competition is. Uh, so you got to give your salespeople some information so they know how to sell your product and who to sell it to. Your competitive analysis is one of the most common common bits of information that is always requ requested. You know, because people say, well, how does it compare? So arm your sales force, which is also your reseller sales force, with this information. You'll also have some product spec sheets, some ad templates if you have any, um, some email templates. So if there's any templates that you've used to go out there and direct response and try and pull business in. Then you can put samples of these templates in your portal. If you've got any white papers, case studies, the one thing you don't put in here is don't put a bunch of trash that's all over your regular website. Don't try to replicate your website in the portal and then add to it. Because what happens is there's too much content. Some of the biggest vendors out there, I go to their portal site and they're just trash. They're filled with everything that's on their regular website plus everything else. And it's like an encyclopedia trying to go through all of that stuff. So we simplify just think salespeople, they are highly tactical. Um, they don't want to waste much time. They want to get in there, grab the information, get out, head to their appointment. So you'd also put your sales presentations, your brand and logo guidelines, graphic library, reseller forums. So if they want to collaborate on deals and some other kind of things. So these are the these are most of the deliverables to put together. There's some additional ones too, but these are the most common ones. Okay, there's also some decisions you have to make with your program. You have to decide, okay, what about product training? Okay, so here's some examples. You know, new programs, you should have free training, have no barriers. Sales, for example, I mean, Salesforce has a program where it's, I don't know what it is, you know, right now, but as the last time I looked, it's about $5,000 for you to send somebody through their training materials. Well, it's a day long. It doesn't cost $5,000. It's a barrier to entry. 
So what they're doing is they're reducing the number of people because their software is so popular right now. Okay, so mature programs have barriers, paid training, and pricing certification. Don't follow that model. They didn't usually follow that model when they first got started, so don't you do the same thing. They may have just started 10 years ago. Okay, a lot of these will typically have free video training. So here's a couple examples like PlanSwift. They've got over 80 free videos by topic on the product. And then I even work with the companies I, I consult with and have them uh, just use something like Camtasia and record a video of them going through the portals, their partner portal site also. So these are all self-serve. So as your program gets a little bit bigger and you get a lot of people you're trying to deal with, you can get them through some training automatically or set up an LTM, a learning training management system, um, to be able to do this for you. Okay, the thing is, is another thing that they're going to ask for is product training. Then do you have a dedicated sales rep? Well, small companies always say yes. Large companies, it's usually a perk. If you are just uh, authorized Microsoft, you might just have to call in and get whatever channel manager you, you can. If you're a, a billion dollar reseller for Microsoft, you're going to call in, you're going to get one or two specialized people that are dedicated to your account. So this is a perk. If you've got that as an advantage, then you want to make sure you give yourself a check mark for it. Okay, the next thing is reseller tech support. So for a small company, it's not a big deal, but a large company, might they might need a special hotline just for the resellers so they don't have to wait in the regular queue. So they don't have to call up and wait 20 minutes when they're on site at a location. They need to be able to call in and wait 30 seconds and be able to get this. We'll also define it by pre-sale support, online RMA, RMA, this is primarily applicable for hardware, not so much with SaaS. Okay, but hardware where you've got returns, rever re reverse logistics, it's really nice if you can set up a online way for them to be able to get the information they need to be able to send that back to you. Some products, like let's say when I was working at GE, GE when they did the software, their so software wouldn't support you know, all 25 cameras that might be on the market. They might have only supported the top 15 and then the top 10 readers and so forth. And so sometimes you'll find your resellers out there will sell different components that don't work together. So you need a configurator. If you don't have that kind of a product, then just bypass this. If you do, then set up a little configurator where it ha has what products work with what. And usually a simple database guy can set that up for you. Okay, also, you'll usually want to say that you have an annual partner meeting. Now, if you're a new program, you know, you'll just do a webinar. You can still say, yeah, I have an annual partner meeting. It doesn't mean you're going to spend $100,000 or like when I was at one of my companies, you know, I would spend an average of a couple million dollars on my partner, annual partner meeting. But otherwise, if you're at a small company, just set up a webinar. It might be two to four hours. You'll go through your new products with your product manager. Your new channel manager might go through some new promotions. You might go through some new competitive analysis. You might have a couple of your alliance partners pitch in. Okay, but start with a webinar and then move it out to something a lot bigger later. The next thing is they want to know, you know, do you have FAE, which is Field Application Engineering Support? So that's typically not needed for SaaS, but when I was dealing with high-end technical hardware, we would have to have field application engineers stop into the locations when they're setting everything up the first time. And then again, pre-post-sale engineer is not typical, but these are all things you want to consider, and these are all things on that competitive program that I showed you. you just go through and put a tick mark or, or an X on everything you ought to have and a zero on everything you don't need and then provide the material for the rest of this and it sort of defines your program for you. The next thing is a certification program. So it's designed to help your partners, number one, to get up to speed on the product so they know how to sell it. Okay, also so they can learn the product well enough for installations and everything else where they can make some money from professional services. Sometimes they're like, I can't compete with your product. It's like, yeah, my product requires all kinds of support. You can make a truckload of money, so turn support into one of your value-added services. Okay, so because a lot of your reseller partners can provide better first and second line support because they can go right onto the site. You know, while you're talking through with everyone, they just go onto the site and they just knock it right out. Also, they can integrate with different applications. Now, it can be less rigorous with the SaaS since the network is already set up, but sometimes I've seen some SaaS that still require a lot of cleaning of the data before you get it into their system, a lot of importing, a lot of setup, and sometimes even some customization of screens and everything else where the end user has access to that, but as your value add, as a reseller, you can go in there and provide some of those services. And I've seen some SaaS vendors, for example, say that 
It's like, well, nobody knows my product as well as I do. And I said, don't put it past these resellers. Again, like that one example that I gave earlier that had 58 developers, these are some serious development houses. So a lot of times their support is going to be far superior to yours because they can develop, you know, even an application that fills a hole that your application has. And plus, when you can set up this kind of a certification, then the dealer, the more skin they have into it, the more invested, then the, the greater their loyalty. Remember, with a shared sales force, when you sell competitive products, you need to make sure that you have a high, what, what I call, reseller recommendation rate, where they prefer recommending your product versus the competition. One way to do that is, is through a certification program. Okay, and then the certification program is tied to the reseller levels, like I mentioned. Maybe gold requires first level certification, platinum requires first level product, and maybe first and second level of support. And then usually what I do on this is I usually, the most common material that resellers want are PowerPoints, competitive analysis, you know, a price, there's just a couple of basics they all need. And then I add additional material as the program matures, you know, as we go farther down. But I'm, I don't necessarily have to wait to get all of that stuff before I can launch. I can launch and then I can build that as it's being requested. Especially things like email templates and ad templates and everything else. Okay, the next thing when we look at this, resellers want pre-qualified leads. So any salesperson out there wants pre-qualified leads. So you always say that you include it even if you only send one lead per year. But it's one of the key things that they're looking at when they make that decision. Can I make any money with you guys? So if you don't have leads, then fix it. Set some promotions up, your website, your referral, a follow-up. I have quite a few steps. My kit has a lot of that stuff in it. You guys can get it at the channel site. Um, so SaaS sells a lot of stuff direct. Okay, but at the same time, you've got other ways that you can send leads out to these people, especially when someone needs some integration or they need some, some add-on capabilities and you have an open API. Okay, so internal sales, again, they don't call out of a phone book, so why should external 100% commission salespeople do it? Okay, so in addition to this, you also need a lead policy to ensure that your leads are followed up on a timely manner. The sample portal site that you see, by the way, it's going to come up there. There's going to be a button that says password. There is no password. Just click the button and let you straight in. And when you look up at the top part, the first part, you'll see some different policies, including a lead policy. This one has been, all the material on the portal site has been refined probably 50 times over. It's really, really good. Just follow that stuff and you're going to be fine. Resellers are going to be impressed. Deal registration. Okay, so here's what happens. A reseller finds a deal. He registers their deal with you. Okay, so his concern of registering a deal is that you're going to steal the deal. Okay, so you tell him if he registers the deal, you're not going to call on it. If somebody calls up, First thing your team does is they just look up the person's name, if the name's already there, and says, hey, I see you're working with, you know, this VAR, you know, Austin VAR, and so how can I help you? So they might ask some different questions, if it's pricing or some other stuff. He's like, well, what are they quoting you? Because I, you know, you'll have to go back to your, your reseller for that information. But you can still give them pre-sale support, but at the same time, you know that you're not. And for some reason, if you make a mistake, then... This deal registration is an agreement that you have with the reseller. If you make a mistake, then they're going to get their full commission. Okay, sometimes, you know, you may say, okay, well, I still want to disclose the deal. So you might have it where the internal person makes, you know, 20% or half of their commission they would usually make because they didn't really have to do anything. They just closed an order. Well, that's a big deal. It's the other person may have been spending three months with that person to get them to that stage. Okay, so there are benefits of getting registering their deals is they get exclusive pricing so here's what I mean let's say for example if I have a gold certified person that they're, they're going to make 20% margin here's the way I split that up I might say okay you get 10% regular margin when you register the deal you get the other 10% if they're platinum it might be the same way you get 20% normal and you get 10% more if you register the deal so that's their exclusive pricing so if somebody else comes in and tries to register the same deal Essentially, there's going to be channel conflict. You can be competing. Why well, have two salespeople competing for the same deal? You're the same company, essentially. And so what you do is they can go ahead and take that deal if they want, but they might be making 10% than the next guy. So if they try to bid on that, they've got to realize they don't have an inside advantage. Plus, if they register the deal, then preferred pre-sale support. 
So that means if they bring us to the dance, we're going to dance with just them. If the other guy says, hey, can you give a PowerPoint presentation to my account? We're like, sorry, that's already registered with somebody else. I can't help you with that. Okay, and that's, that's the advantage, and that's the policy that you set up. You bring the deal to us, we're going to stay with you. Vice versa, if we send you a lead, we don't want you to switch them to some competitor, or you're going to find those leads are going to dry up real quick. So you promise that you will not call on the registered opportunities direct, and you'll credit them if their accounts order direct. So again, this is very simple, and you know it's like once this program was set up by one company, one vendor out there, everybody had to set this up. It just made a lot of sense. And this is how you get compliance. How do you get them to register the deal? I mean, they got to do paperwork. Well, they get an extra 10% margin. So the total margin that you're allocating to the reseller partner program, and at each of those levels, you just set a portion of that. And if you have less compliance, you set more and more of a portion of that until they comply. And pretty soon they'll get the drift that you're serious. They're not going to make their full margin, you know, if, if they don't do that. So these are just these are basic little policies that make these programs work. Otherwise, I, I see people who say, it's not working. They're not registering. I said, well, how, do you give them more if they register? No. And why would I? There's no reason to. Well, we give them more pre-sale support. Yeah, but if your product doesn't need it. So anyway, these are some of the, the insider tricks that will help you to create a good program. Okay, so your benefits. Here's your benefits of them registering the deal. You'll know what's coming down the pipeline, so you can forecast properly. You can elect to work with them on the largest bid. So let's say one comes in and it's a $250,000 deal. Holy cow, you might take your best salesperson and turn them loose on that to work with them to help them close that deal. They brought it to the table. They're going to make all the commission. But you can't just let that kind of money walk away. But this way, at least you know when these bids are coming in, and they're not afraid of you working with them. They're there to help them to make money. So it also helps you don't have as much tenant conflict. So you don't have the same salespeople, two different salespeople, either internal or external. It doesn't make any difference. They're both your salespeople, but they're not competing for the same business. And then also, it helps to prevent margin erosion. Because if you get too many salespeople in there, you know, you're going to have price erosion. Sort of like, you know, if you're in the retail, you've got Best Buy, you've got Walmart, you've got Target, and they're all selling the same thing. Let's say it's some, you know, Apple iPhone accessory, and they're all sitting next to each other in the same mall. Those guys are all fighting it out for margins. But in this particular case, if you can reduce the number of resellers, because they get some degree of exclusivity on margins and everything else, then you can reduce the chance of competition from your own partners. Can they still take the order? Sure. Someone might say, hey, I'll, I'll take no margin on this. I want the hardware deal. Or I want the service for this. And so you'll still have some that will go in there and compete. But those guys are hustling. You know, and that's, that's why it's a little okay. That's why it's okay to have a little bit of channel conflict. Okay, so the policy details within the portal will show you how the deal registration is set up. And even the way it's described is very non-legalese because I've seen some deal registration. I saw one, there's 20 pages. You know, reseller looks at that and says, good grief, I can't sign up for these guys. I'll have to go hire an attorney just to look through that blasted document. So mine contains the essentials and nothing else. Okay, also you'll offer front-end discounts. Now, front-end discounts, you know, you'll say, okay, we offer front-end discounts. A lot of times that's deal registration. You register your deal, you get a front-end discount. Back-end discounts, this is where you might run a rebate or a promotion or something else. So these are things that resellers look for. So when you resell a partner program, you see the sample, you'll see like a grid that says, what do you have? What do you not have? Okay, so you want to list that you have these things because it's very easy to do it. Just do it one time and you've got back-end discounts. We'll do it twice and you get the plural. Okay, bid desk. It's not that important if you don't have a complicated product. If you've got one that really requires sophisticated bids, then again, this is something that you want to be able to set up. Okay, the reseller locator is also really nice. I've seen some, you know, we all see them. You know, if you want to find out where's the local Walmart, you just go to Walmart, store locator, type in your zip code, and you show them by distance. Okay, so there's lots of software out there that'll do it for you. But when you've got a smaller reseller program, you know, let's say you've only got 100 resellers in the United States, then you might break up your area and you might start with a graphical map. So they click on Texas, and it's part of Texas, Oklahoma, and, you know, all the way to Arizona. It might cover quite a few different states, and then you just show your resellers. The next thing you want to do is also make sure that your resellers are listed according to their certification levels. So again, it's, it's one of the benefits. If they are willing to create loyalty and get to that level, then you create loyalty and make sure that, that the people out there know that these guys are the most skilled. They're your gold or your platinum, 
or your silver, your authorized partners. And so you'll have a, there's also something else on this. Whenever I start recruiting, the first thing I do is I go after my competitors' resellers. So it's very interesting. One of my companies I was at internally, uh, when I was there, I noticed that, that um, I'll tell you who it is because they're not owned by the same company anymore. It's Goldmine, you know, before they were acquired by Bid Data, which is now a little front range. When, when uh, Salesforce, or not before Salesforce, but SalesLogic started, they pilfered over 800 resellers off the Goldmine website. And so I was a little ticked. So what we did is we just put a redirect script on that. So we put certain URLs, if they were coming from these URLs from our competitors, then it would redirect them to a different location where maybe it showed like, you know, a small little database of resellers. Nobody else is going to get that. But they're going to get that. They're going to see a dummy page that's just full of trash or a bunch of garbage resellers or something else that, you know, Best Buy and, you know, it's a VAR product. Um, so it just sends them in the wrong direction. And that's one way to be able to handle this. Because again, the web's got a, it's a two-edged sword. Competition can go there. So a simple redirect script, and they're very easy to, you know, most of your web guys will be able to figure one out that'll work for you. Okay, this way they won't be able to pill for your resellers like I pill for everyone else's resellers. Okay, the next thing to look at is NFR. This um, evals is another term sometimes people use, but evals usually applies to hardware. Sometimes an eval policy, you know, where maybe you might check out a certain number of units um, or you might have a discounted price, sometimes below even the cost of goods. Sometimes the evals might go out and might be sent to them for three months or for three weeks. Uh, like even at Motorola, for example, we had, we had these great big set-top complete kits. There was a great big workstation that would ship by moving truck. And so we might ship those out for three months at a time for certain big deals that our partners were working on. We might have had 10 of those that go in, you know, throughout the entire United States. Okay, but this is really NFRs, it's really you're not for resale copies. Or if it's a SaaS product, it just means access to SaaS. Okay, the key is resellers are not your end users. It's like really, do you, do you take your existing salespeople and you say, okay, when you come on board, I'm gonna charge you for that software. You know, say it's $1,000 for the software, but I'm gonna let you have it for 500. No, that's ridiculous. So why are you charging resellers? Why are you trying to make margin on those guys? Well, sometimes it's perfectly fine to charge them a nominal amount. The concept of what we obtain too cheaply, we esteem too lightly. So I found that when we gave the software away for free, in the old days with Ashton Tate, we came by and we, we gave each, each location three sets, five copies of software times three, so 15 copies of software per location we went to. When we cycled through, you know, about 90 days later, we found that very few actually even installed or used the software. But if we charged them as much as five bucks, 10 bucks a package, then it was over 70%, you know, of those resellers would use it. So again, it was very different, you know, if you just establish a small value to it. Now, sometimes you don't have to charge them for it. So one of the way to do that is, is they have to answer these 10 questions. Anything that shows that they put skin into the game. If they can answer these 10 questions, then they can have access to your system. You know, they might have to know your price. And there's a couple of examples. I've got some samples within the channel kit. Okay, joint reseller promotions. This is essentially your MDF and co-op funds. And here's the way that I look at that. Is let's say, for example, if you consider these resellers your regional offices. And so one of the companies I was with, we had 22 regional offices throughout the United States. And so in those regional offices, a lot of times we want to have a regional marketing manager that might handle about five of those regional manager regional offices each. They would do regional ads, they would do regional events, they would optimize the web pages for those regions specifically to pull up local traffic. So these resellers consider them your regional managers. And so if you have a hundred thousand dollars that you might spend internally on promoting the product, you might spend forty thousand of that and let it go out on a resale basis if you think that's a good use to your funds. The key on any MDF or co-op program is you don't have to spend any, anything on any of this if you want to. These, it's all at your discretion. And so you'll see that I have some policies in that portal site that go through and talk about MDF and co-op and different type of policies on how you should handle that. Um, and usually it's a 50-50 program because if they don't have any skin in the game, they're going to just keep hitting you up. But if it costs them half the amount, they have to also make sure that they get a ret good return out of their money, too. So, and you can read more about this on the Channel Mall portal site. 
Okay, the next thing we do after that is we now set up requirements. So the first thing we always want to do is we want to set these resellers up so there's a reseller agreement. There was a billion dollar company I was working with and they didn't even have a simple reseller agreement. I was like, oh my goodness, the IRS could go after you. They might consider them true partners. They may consider them employees even. So a reseller agreement sets up the nature of the legal agreement between the two of you and sets down the rules and everything else so that, that, that everything's up front. Everyone knows what they're getting into. Okay, it also sets up the vertical markets. You know, one of my companies paying 38000 just to reprofile. So what I mean by this is, is you want to make sure you get enough information on that form. I see, I see reseller applications and, and they're hardly, you know, some, some have got hardly any information. And then later, you know, a year later, you're, okay, let me, I've got these top, you know, I've got 300 resellers and I've got 100 of them that are doing better than the other, the other 200, but you have no information about them in your database. You have no idea why. Maybe you found out that you sell an application that, that dovetails with VMware. And maybe if they are VMware resellers, that's the primary difference. Why do you want to know that? Because then you want to go out and, and recruit more VMware resellers. So you got to profile your resellers so you can find more just like your best ones. So get a lot of information. You can see on the channel sample for registration, it asked about, you know, do you work regionally? You know, what are your certifications? How many engineers do you have internally? You know, what's your sales? What's your software sales, service sales, hardware sales? You know, one says, oh yeah, this guy's a $50 million reseller. And I said, yeah, but they only sell a million dollars a year with a software, and most of it's Oracle. It's a big hardware house. It sells great big IBM mainframe stuff. A little bit of software on the side. So you got to break that down and get that information. The next is qualifies a bar. Again, I usually only do that if I'm if I'm if I'm looking for a barrier. <clears throat> so most of the time, if they come there, if they're willing to fill out the paperwork, then I'm gonna give them a fair shot at this. Okay, the next thing is purchase from an authorized distributor. This is really, you know, SaaS, it doesn't even apply at all. A lot of times I'll put this on here because what it does is your competitors are trying to see your reseller program. Some of the reseller programs out there, for example, like Salesforce, I don't know if they still have it, but you could go through and sign all their stuff. As a competitor, you press OK and it automatically gives you access to all of their, all of their confidential stuff. I was like, you're kidding me. I couldn't believe it. Okay, but what this will do is, is if they think that your reseller program will automatically authorize them, which it should not, you should pull the trigger with the person internally that reviews the application, okay, then if you put authorized distributor, they don't have an authorized distributor number. Of course, you don't either, but they don't know that. And so they can't find one, so it stops them cold, and they stop trying to apply to your reseller program. Okay, the next thing over here is requirements. Require a business plan. Actually, it's more of a plan of action. You know, it's not a business plan that's a 2,500-page document. It's just a plan of action. Essentially, it's what are you going to do to promote this product on a month-to-month -month basis? And so I usually set up one promotion per month for the first three months to ensure, you know, that these guys are doing something. Okay, I'll talk about that a little bit more in the enablement. Also, you set up a reseller agreement. So I have lots of samples on my website. Um, and this, this uh, you know, things like right to use the logo, termination clause, that they're independent of yourself. And so there's some elements that you're going to find in these reseller agreements, including the sample one that's on the channel partner portal. Also, sales quotas, you can let people know but a lot of times when you're first setting up a program, you're going to determine that within the first three to six months. You don't have enough information to even determine what the quote is going to be. And then that's why, so you set up a ramp up period to achieve this, and then you try to set a quota that's reasonable. They've got to stretch, but it's reasonable. Otherwise, you know, salespeople, if you say, you got a $10 million quota and the best salesperson in the world can only do a million, then don't even talk about, you know, the extra margin they're going to get because it's never going to happen. Okay, the last thing I look at over here is the reseller experience. How easy are you to do business with? Okay, by the way, this little chart here, this shows the reseller partner program benefits. Gold, platinum, you know, gold, um, platinum, gold, authorized, and so forth. So you're going to find an example of this. This sort of explains your partner program. And again, a lot of times I go to somebody's partner portal site and they're talking all about their product. It's like, look. Remember, the two decisions, do you have a competitive product? They've already made that decision, so stop it. Stop overselling. All they want to do now is, can I make any money? And your partner program shows them how they're going to make money. Free training, joint promotions, not for resale access, all that kind of stuff. Deal registration, things that they know help them to get money. There's one little thing on this. 
is pre-sign it phone number. Okay, for example, Links is, you know, I just got to point these guys out. It was my record of seven phone calls to get hold of a channel manager. Seven. That was ridiculous. Salesforce.com, I finally had to send an email out to their press person to have one of their senior vice presidents call me up because I wanted information about their partner program to show at one of my SaaS conferences as a good example. Then I found out they were a terrible example and they fixed a lot of that since. But back then, it's like, what a pain. So this pre-sign up phone number, so what you'll do is on your application, you know, you put the guy's name, let's say it's John Doe at the phone number. Put the phone number there. Because when you when somebody, when a reseller is trying to get, you know, a confused prospect doesn't buy. So let's say they say, well, I don't see your margins on the website. They want to call up and see if your margins are at least as good as one of the other companies are considering. And so they want a phone number to call. And they don't want to call into a switchboard. A lot of large corporations, the switchboard won't send someone. Can you send me to your channel manager? Who are you? Are you a recruiter? Because recruiters will try to get a hold of these people. So they won't give out that information. They'll say, well, send an email in. You know, you've already sent three or four in. So again, it's just one of the simplest things to put on your website, but it dramatically increases your, your, um, uh, your reseller experience. So then a grid of the program details, you know, making sure that you have an automated email response. And there's got to be something that shows, are they going to send you leads? You know, perceived lead generation capability. Okay, and then the sign up page. So see, here's a sample. Notice down here, here's Tiger Ted, here's the partner program down here, here's an email address, even if that's a graphic, so, so they don't get spammed to death. But essentially, this here shows, here's what a sign up page should look like. Just explain you know, your basic little fluffy copy here on the top, but get right into the bullets of your resale program, not for resale copies, free product, your registration, free training. Those are all things they're looking for in a good reseller program, and you're gonna put it front and center. This is not all this garbage about, here's my product. We're so great. We win all these awards. They know all that. They're, 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 they want to sign up. They just need to know, can I make any money with you guys? Okay. And so notice basic hello. I'm not going to read that part. Program features, the bullets, no product hype. Link to a grid of the program. Link to the application. Like right here, click here to apply. Channel manager contact information provide. This is so simple. And yet I would probably say, 60 to 70 percent of every website that I go to, especially the big companies, just miss this completely. And resellers that I talk to just get ticked off because they just can't find what they're looking for. And they wonder why they have a hard time recruiting. Okay, so those are the elements of defining a reseller program. Okay, let's take a look at a couple SaaS specific issues. Okay, most SaaS programs have a recommender program. They call it a recommender program. That's really an affiliate program. So here here I've got recommender program 45%, I've got affiliate 29, but the affiliate is probably more like 45 because they're the same. That's why I defined terms when we first got started. The aggregator, some say that they go through an aggregator, similar to a distributor. Um, there's some out there that use that combine SaaS applications. Um, OEM may or may not be private label, that's original equipment manufacturer. So some products, like one company that I've worked with in the past, um, 76% of their product was OEM. Other people private labeled it. And then some use a wholesale distributor, but SaaS products typically don't need a wholesale distributor. Okay, it's like, why? They just order direct. Okay, have resellers, 41% have resellers. 11.4% expect to have resellers of those that did not. So it's a total of 52% are expecting to be able to use a reseller channel. 48% of SaaS surveyed got 20% of the revenues via channel, because again, most of it's still going to go direct. But 80% um, of that is through many non-SaaS. Now let me explain why SaaS seems to be having a hard time at times recruiting a channel. Someone says, oh, SaaS doesn't work with the channel. I said, that's a bunch of rubbish. And I've sold millions of dollars of product through a SaaS channel. So here's the difference. Okay, there's some specific issues in here. Well, one is usually the margins for regular products are higher. Okay, but don't let that fool you. Because here's the typical reseller margins for SaaS. Typically, 60% pay about 1% to 15% margin. What that really is is 10 to 15% is your typical affiliate fee. Okay, so that's why they're affiliates. They're not really resellers. They're affiliates, and that's common. Some pay 16 to 30% margin. 21% pay 40% margin or higher. And some of those might even be smaller companies are getting very, very aggressive. Okay, but there's also something very different. 
within a, a desktop enterprise pro product, it might be anywhere between 20 to 50 percent for that product. But remember, there's so much competition for some of those products that it starts at 50 percent MSRP. Let's say it's a thousand dollars, so they can actually get that product for 500, but they're going to sell it for 600 and make 10 percent margin. Why? Because there's too many bidders for the deal, too much competition. So they might have, say, I get a 50 percent margin, but by the time they discount it they might really only get a 30% margin. The one benefit for SaaS products is they don't get discounted. The reseller can't discount the product. So for example, if the company says, this is my price, you know, it's $50 a month. For this, the reseller just says it's $50 a month. They don't typically negotiate on pricing. They negotiate usually on other areas like training. You know, this is how they'll negotiate their price. They'll give more training or they'll do installation for free or customization or migration or training or something else, either free or some discounted rate. Okay, so you have to compare apples to apples. So if you go out with your reseller and they say 30% margin, what are you even talking about? It's like, well, it's 30% margin, but that's actually how much you keep. I know with your current desktop product, you're only making 30% margin. No, we got 50% discount. Yeah, but you have to discount 20% just to get the bid. Here you go out at 30% and keep all 30%. They're like, oh, okay. So you have to make sure you know how to explain your reseller partner better or you're going to lose it. You know, they're going to think that you're being chintzy and you're not. So even with lower guaranteed margins, um, VARs and so forth expect to make a majority of the revenues with your professional services. So, you know, they're not going to be, they might make $10,000 off selling your product. They might make another $20,000 on installing it and doing some integration work. So that's the real money and that's what VARs, that's how they make their money. Okay, now here's some other concerns of resellers with SaaS. You want to know who owns that account? So a SaaS vendor owns the account activity. And a VAR should still make revenue off the training and integration support. Okay, but they need to have some feeling of ownership or they won't support their sale. So, so again, these are some of the dynamics. And so you just sit down and come up with some rules as to how you want to set this up. And, and you have to realize, okay, these are the dynamics that you're dealing with. So if you want them to sell it, you know, you've got to have them have some sense of control. Some companies have it so the resellers, you build the reseller, and the reseller turns around and builds their system. But some resellers don't have an accounting mechanism to bill on a monthly basis. And so some don't want that approach. So they want you to bill their customers direct because you've got a billing system that can handle all of that. And then you just pay them, you know, a commission, as you might say. So there's a couple different type of approaches. One of the ways I look at that is if you're in an area with several competitors, just see how your competitors do it with their resellers. And then decide you want to match that. If they're already doing the optimal approach, then you're going to have to do that or you're not going to get any traction. If they're not, then you may decide there might be a way to be able to have them, you know, have the, the checks dumped into their account so a portion goes into your... Anyway, there's some creative approaches that I've seen that people have done. Okay. So here's another question. Is there needs to be alignment. For example, if your internal people get paid a certain amount and on a certain basis and your resellers don't, then you're going to have some problem. The salesperson needs an extra thousand dollars to make a house payment. He has an option to sell a ten thousand dollar desktop and make a thousand dollar commission, versus a twelve thousand dollar SaaS application, hundred dollars a month. So he'll make two hundred dollars more money on that. The problem is he's only getting hundred dollars that month with this particular model. So what's he going to push? He needs a thousand dollars. He's going to push the desktop application. This starts explaining why SaaS applications didn't pick up. Had nothing to do with the application. Had everything to do with the motivation for the sales guy. It's going to $100 to sell yours, even if we'll make it more over time. Well, he needs $1,000 to pay his rent, so your product's not going to go out the door. The desktop is. Okay. So how resellers are paid is a fundamental problem with selling SaaS. It's like the car insurance industry. So it takes a while to build up residual income. So transition, you know, for the line card, usually... Uh, has traditional sales, so they might sell some of a regular product, eventually SaaS, eventually they'll work up to it, and they'll be earning a certain amount of money on a month-to-month -month basis, you know, depending on how your program is set up. And if you set it up that way, eventually they can start to sell all SaaS and afford to do it. So it's strictly just a matter of how you do this. Okay, so it's, you know, which one's going to pay them quicker, more stable income. So there's the stability, you know, that they get this month-to-month -month payment, or this money all up front, but a lot of times in the SaaS application, they're going to make more money over time, a lot more money over time. Sometimes over five years, they might make three times the amount that they would have made otherwise. 
depending on, again, how you have your program set up. So I'm going to show you in a second some different models of how companies have set it up. So how a reseller is paid, an advantage of SaaS, the sales and implementation cycle. You know, it's usually shorter because the lower initial payment price is lower. So it's a lot easier for your company to set 10 people up with Salesforce that is 500 bucks, $50 a month times 10, versus $600 for gold mine per person per month. That's $6,000 versus 500. If you don't have a budget for it, 500 is a whole lot easier to get. So it'll shorten your sales cycle. Resellers may know the advantages, but, it's, but again, if it's not their model, you have to explain the model. So you have to educate. Everyone that does SaaS has to educate their market. They have to do market development. So they have to have a couple presentation slides that show the advantages of SaaS along with you know, their product. So let's take a look at this. Align your commission with your sales objectives. So take a look at this. Here's the payout schedule. Typically on a $1 to $5 million company, they pay 28% of it up front. So you might, let's say, get, if you sell a $1,000 product, you might get 25, 200, Let's say you might. Let's say your commission is a thousand dollars for a ten thousand dollar product. You might get two hundred fifty dollars up front. The rest of it might be parsed out over the rest of the year or over the entire life. If it's five to ten men, so you notice the larger companies, the more cash they have on hand, the more they can up front. So they'll pay fifty percent up front. The other they might pay over two months, or over three months, or over six months. So there's a little bit of just. And, and again, it's just. It's, you know, you think this is really complicated. It's like, no, do you want these guys to sell your product? The more you can pay them up front, the easier it is for them to sell it. And so can you cash flow it? If you can't cash flow it, then, um, you, you know, you got to come up with it. Here's, and some prorated over the life of the product. Here's some part up front, the rest is prorated. So here's the ratios. And this is from the most recent um, study that was out there from, from uh, Softletter. Okay, so... Here's some, and this is from the SAS conference that, that hits up about every quarter that tells some of these things. So this is some of the stuff that I got from Rick Chapman. Uh, so it's great information. And so appears, so you take a look at this right here. Appears the more revenue, the quicker the sales people get paid. Salesforce is an exception, but we can't always follow them. So again, unless you, you're this big behemoth where they've got to sell Salesforce, Salesforce pays people, at least the last time I looked, very slowly. It was really terrible. A lot of salespeople might, might close the deal, and then they might even not get paid the first amount for, you know, for three months on some of those. So it's, it's like, wow, that's terrible. Okay, why others, you know, they close the deal and they get a paycheck the next week. The faster you can associate the check with the close, the more motivated your sales force is. And again, stop thinking these, thing, these guys as us and them. These are not... You know, they're just an external sales force that's working more on commission basis. Okay, so if we want our salespeople to sell it, then we have to compete with the desktop, so then we have to line this all up. So again, there's a couple of rules and other kind of stuff, but, but this is at least some of the basics that you've got right up front. Creative options, depending on your financing and cash flow, depends on your resi residual cancellation rate. If you don't have anyone cancel, then you can afford to pay them over time. You know, and they'll know all of that stuff, too, as they start to work with you and realize it's like, I'm going to get paid out of my commission next year, but 70% of my people cancel in the first year. This is a bum deal. Okay, again, if you're ripping your salespeople off, they're going to catch it and you'll lose your channel, just like your internal salespeople. Okay, so here's a case study of, of Salesforce. So over a billion, I interviewed Steve Lucas, two referrals, a referral program, a consultant program. This gives you a couple logistics of the program. Um, they had 6,200 referrals, 550 VARs. Okay, just to let you know, Intuit had 36,000 referral partners, not 6,200. $100 million out of a billion dollar company that's coming out of there. Microsoft claims they have over 20,000 resellers. So a couple of things here. How much, you know, how, how much do they pay? They pay referrals 10%. That's why I said sort of the average is 10 to 15% for referral. Okay, and then how do they pay? Based on whatever revenue comes in, on the first year only. Okay, they, I didn't ask their payment method, check, direct deposit, PayPal, etc., but that has a big deal too. You know, if they're sending a check, add a week. You know, sometimes they add three weeks for the check to come through versus a direct deposit, PayPal. So the key is the faster you can pay them, the more motivated they are to sell your product. So I mean, this is sort of common sense if you're in sales management. Okay, how do they pay? So I didn't ask who closes for the second year. 
Um, but the resellers have to register for a referred deal. And when do they pay? 45 days after the end of the quarter. So again, look at this. Four and a half months later, Doggy does trick. Four and a half months later, Doggy gets paid. Well, Doggy doesn't associate doing tricks with getting, get, you know, doing <laughs> tricks with getting paid. So Doggy doesn't do a whole lot of tricks unless someone beats him to death. Or in this case, customers say, I must have Salesforce, so he has to sell it. But this is not the way to sell up a sales a SaaS program. I consider this one of the worst examples. You know, how often do they pay inside sales? You know, they double pay. They pay the affiliate, then they pay the inside sales per sale for closing the lead. And I was like, wow, this is silly. What, you, you're so arrogant that you somehow think your own people are the only ones who can close some deals? Some of those resellers have awesome closers. Turn those guys loose and give them some extra margin for doing it. Okay, so lots of mistakes. Larger companies can make these mistakes. Okay, but you can't afford to if you're starting with a new program. Okay, so a lot of these, they already have momentum. They've got brand preference. You know, you got to buy Salesforce, so they got you over a barrel. And if you got to sell it, you're going to get paid four and a half months later. You're only going to get paid 15%. It's like, this is not very cool. Okay, so this is not the way to sell, set up, you know, don't reward they don't reward partners that could close the deal themselves and make the inside sales commission. And it wouldn't cost them a dime more to do this. So they're neglecting some awesome closers. These are resellers. That's resale. They know how to close deals. Okay, so again, paying four and a half months late. Most affiliate programs pay every 30 days. The closer the pay is to the results, the more motivated the salespeople is to produce more sales. Duh. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so they only pay the first year. Simple, easy to understand, but does not encourage them to localize service the first year. Does not encourage multi-year deals does not follow the insurance industry residual sale model. So here they want to set it up like the insurance industry, but those insurance guys, they can, if they can hold accounts for 10 years, they'll make money off of that for 10 years after the initial sale. Very little work. All they have to do is, you know, even the company bills. They just have to make sure they're there to answer the questions and be really friendly and send you your new uh, certificates every single time that you go in for your car registration. Okay, so unless more is paid up front, then partners have to have deferred pay by selling SaaS. Okay, so this is why some people have a problem selling SaaS because their commission structure is just all screwed up. Okay, so if you understand what those issues are, there's nothing unusual about selling SaaS. It's just selling the software. The issue is how fast can they get paid for it? Okay, so said they looked at a lot of other partner programs but wanted to be innovative and simple. Innovative, for, the, for its own sake, is not always the best model. You know, so I listened to all that, and it just told me, it's like, they don't have a clue. Completely clueless on this. And this is my opinion based on working with most of the major channel programs on the planet. Okay, so here's a, here's an They've got a new VAR program. It's still very, very basic. It needs some refinement. You know, so they've set up some residual avenues. You know, cons auto approval. I couldn't believe that. No levels, no minimums, no loyalty, no segmentation. Again, they need to go through this material and they, they'd be able to see real quickly that there are some basics that would take me an hour talking with them to fix. Okay, so let's go into the next stage now. So we're through the phase of defining your program, even defining your commissions and everything else. And you can look at some of those mo modules. You can call up and talk to me too and I can give you some ideas on how, how I'd recommend you set that up. But it's, it's a 15-minute conversation. This is not a big deal. But you do need to make sure you make that decision. The next phase is recruiting. We're going to buzz through these slides really quick now. Okay, so you go by vertical type, geographical reseller, you know, technical capability. So you obtain yourself a list. My first list source is always my competition. I always do a Counter-Strike campaign. I go after my competitors' resellers. The second place I go to is alliances. So for example, like what I gave earlier, if your alliance is with VMware, and let's say Citrix has 2,200 something auto resellers, then, then I'm trying to recruit their resellers. Sometimes talk to the company directly. See if they'll put your name in the, in the newsletter to go out and recruit their resellers to sell you because you make more money together than separately. Okay, and then some specialized lists. The CMP has a list, Soft Database, the Bar City. These are some locations for a list I have in the, in the reseller kit that I can send out to everybody. Um, you'll get a list of different sources of where you get your reseller names. Okay, so you, you know, then you can obtain it also by SIP code. Um, but a lot of those will not have emails. And you really want to try your email campaign first because there's no cost. You want to build up your first batch of resellers at no cost and use the revenue from that 
So if you have to then spend some money, like do a direct mail campaign that might cost you, you know, three thousand dollars or something, you know, it'd be nice to even see if your Salesforce is going to take off first. Create prospecting management database so you can do it in Goldmine, Act, Interspire, Salesforce. Set up your fields for working with your partners, not even have samples of how the field should look like. And then you need to start set up some sort of promotion. So an email campaign, I usually have a three-part initial email campaign that goes out. Um, and the kit has samples of what each of the elements and the timing for each one of those campaigns goes out. Then sometimes you can set up a, an ad campaign. So I've been sponsor for uh, CRN. They had a newsletter that went out on their email, email and I recruited 35 resellers in one the first pass through. I was like, wow, that was easy. You know, it cost me maybe $800 to be part of that. And I got 35 resellers. What a deal. Okay, also CRN, VAR Business, some of the others, you can get display ads, but they must be direct response. So I've got some ad copy stuff on how to set those up on the channel website. You could also do national road sales. I was with a company in the uh, late 80s, early 90s that grew from 300 of us to thousands of people. And what we did is we went out there and we recruited resellers. And so we went out on national road shows, five vendors at a time, and went door to door, 50,000 resellers in our database to recruit resellers. So this is hiring like a rep firm, like the Temp Reps, which is now MarketStar, Mindshare Associates, and some of those. Okay, so once you've recruited those resellers, you know, as soon as they come on board, the first 10 come on board is going to tell you what holds you have in your product. So you've got to get your materials, all this stuff. You've got to get your system, your lead, you know, and then you've got to motivate. These are the elements of enablement. Okay, one thing is it's 100% commission in direct sales force. They take all the risks. They cover their own expenses. They often provide some of their own leads. They can sell multiple competitors' products. So you've got to watch out and get some dealer loyalty. Um, so you get that reseller recommendation. So the key is, should you treat them worse or better than an inside sales employee? They're actually more valuable to you. So, I mean, do your inside salespeople work 100% commission? Chances are they don't. Okay, so don't complicate it. Channel management is sales management. Same rules apply. Manage a channel, managing a sales force, example. Here's what happens. Would you hire a new salesperson and then not train them on your product? Not provide any presentation, no sales scripts, no demo scripts, no dialogues, no model calls, no coaching calls. You wouldn't provide any leads, no systems, have no contest, no motivation, no contact. No? So how come we treat our outside sales force with so much neglect? And so I see people in reseller programs and they have people who've never had any sales management experience or motivation or training or any background that they're just nothing but, but um, they just talk to the people and give them what they want. But they don't, they don't know any of this stuff. So you got to know how to manage the sales force. You know, they say, my channel isn't selling anything. And then they say, my internal sales team is selling. Why? Because I'm not doing anything with your outside channel sales team. You know, they're 100% commission. They take all the risk, so you neglect them. You know, if you paid them salary and commission, you wouldn't neglect them at all. So do the same thing with your internal, with your, with your external as with your internal, and you'll have the same kind of success. I mean, it sounds simple, but they don't do it. Okay, so here's this onboarding process that you have to take. This is like even with your own salespeople, inside salespeople, what do you do with them? You, you know, in this particular case, it shows that you go through a portal orientation, you take them through a product overview, you explain the 90-day promotions, you follow up. So I have a worksheet that I usually use, and the first 10 is where you get your program defined. Then after that, usually the first 50 is where, you know, that's, after that, it starts getting a little bit more complicated. But this sheet will take you through all of the entire process, and it's just part of my reseller kit. Okay, so training, same as you would with inside sales and, and you know, with your with your channel team. Give them detailed product training, start a certification, you know, make sure that they, they know where to go for support, the sales script, presentations, public webinars, sales training, marketing. One thing I recommend is when you've got a new channel, that you tell all those people, you, look, you just get people to the webinar, and we'll do the dog and pony show. You get on the webinar with them so you know exactly what we've talked about, any of their questions, and then afterwards you close the deal. So until you're up to speed on how to sell it, we'll sell the product you know, on these webinars, which is why I always recommend it's like set up those webinars, set them up on a weekly basis so your resellers can invite their prospects to those, and then they can spend their time closing deals and not giving presentations. Eventually they'll watch your webinars and they'll be able to do their own dog and pony show and they won't be dependent on you.
Okay, so the next thing we have to do is motivating. So weekly, monthly, quarterly, I mean, I have all kinds of motivational processes for internal salespeople, and then I work with companies on their channel and they do nothing. They do absolutely nothing with their channel. So you set up similar type of contests and you'll get similar results, but companies get lazy. You know, so they don't assign a resource. They don't have a channel manager. You know, they might have three, three sales managers for their three regions and they don't have a single channel manager you know, or one. So they got three reg regions with 30 people. They got a channel with a thousand resellers and they got one person on that. It sounds like you're shortchanging these guys and yet they have the greater potential for you. So I don't like when they say my channel doesn't work for me. It's like they're just, they have, it's not channel management, it's channel neglect because they don't have a clue. They just don't treat them like they do inside sales. That solves the whole problem. So do all the same things with your channel as you do with your own sales team. You'll get similar results. Again, it seems obvious, but they don't. So it is the same thing as a good sales management, which is not passive. Okay, so I ran a 300-person three, three, sales, 300 sales force at one company, 350, another thousands of people at another, you know, and one was 100% commission. You know, many of these guys, they were my friends. You know, I brought them on board and I said, I'm, I'm, you're not going to fail. You know, if you come on board, you're working 100% commission, but... I will work with you until you succeed. So did they fail? No. You know, I had top teams across the nation. I mean, they didn't fail because they were my friends. So it's like, look, they come on board and they trust you to help them out. And so when you don't, this is immoral. I look at that stuff. So again, this is, this is, this is true channel management. Okay, so let's get to the summary here. The three phases. Definition stage, determining the elements of your reseller program. Recruiting, finding enough of the right kind of resellers to sell your product. And the third is enablement, ensuring they have everything they need to sell and support their customers and prospects. The training, the product, market, competition, resource certification, sales tools. That's why I just get all this stuff formalized. You know, the system, some way for them to be able to get these leads, to do the right deal registration. You know, and so I set up that, that's that sample channel partner portal. That's the partner portal that shows you um, just just mimic that and you'll be set. You'll take care of these guys. And then leads, then the model calls, coaching calls. I got tons of additional stuff, even complete sales training manuals, everything else that show how to do all of that stuff. Then motivation. I've got a complete process called the game of work. I've got PowerPoint presentations on that that show how to motivate your channel, how to motivate your internal sales force. And these don't make small differences. I stepped in with a four-person sales force and increased sales in less than six weeks, 620%. Okay, again, we went from neglect to true management. Okay, so free resource. Go to that channelmail.com. Go to that sample part partner. There's over 500 pages. You print that whole thing out, you're going to go through over a ream of paper. I have over 15,000 unique software and channel visitors per month. I have templates. I have examples of most everything. Some of those, if you register, you get it for free. Otherwise, you, I've even got an online store. As a matter of fact, I've been up, updating it recently. We can buy some of this stuff, like 19 bucks for a complete channel program? Are you kidding? That thing could take you, you know, it cost you $100,000 of mistakes just to come up with a couple of tips you're going to learn within that material. Plus, if you're not signed up yet, stay a day. You know, if you haven't gone to the full channel uh, seminars that I do, the workshops, I have full day and I have two-day boot, uh, boot camps specifically to help either new channel people or even experienced. I get people who've been doing this for five years and they're still doing half their job. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff that they can learn from this. You know, this has taken a decade and you know more, more channel programs than anybody else on the planet that I know of. Um, so, so it's some really, really good stuff. So you can leverage your channel and, and increase your sales. Okay, folks, thank you very much. Uh, this is the, the end of the presentation. I'll be taking some Q&A, but I'm going to close this out for right now. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate that you were able to listen to my voice for this long. Very good, very patient. And let's go ahead and have you follow some of these recommendations. Hit the channel my website up, send me an email, I'll send you a copy of this presentation, and let's go from there. Other than that, thank you very much. I appreciate your time, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.